Welcome to this roundtable on Europe and Africa. My name is Giovanni Carbone. I'm head of the Africa program at ISPE. This is the third conference uh, of the EU Africa initiative that is jointly organized by ISPE and by the Policy Center for the New South based in Morocco. In today's event, we shall discuss the state of affairs in uh, the evolution of EU Africa partnerships. We do this on the occasion of the publication of a new ISPE report on Europe and Africa, the long search for common ground, and of the Policy Center for New South annual report on the geopolitics of Africa. Both reports can be freely downloaded um, from the websites of the two institutes. I would like to welcome our four panelists. Uh, they are uh, Nezalawi Mamdi, Senior Fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. Thanks, Neza, for joining us. Alex Benkenstein, Head of the Governance of Africa's Resources Program at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Welcome, Alex. Amanda Bizong, Policy Officer at the European Center for Development Policy Management. Hello, Amanda. Uh, and Domenico Rosa, Head of Unit for Strategic Partnership with Africa and ACP uh, at the Directorate General for International Partnerships of the European Commission. Thank you very much to all of you for um, joining us and accepting our invitation to contribute to the debate uh, tonight. Um, we have about 45 minutes uh, to hear from our uh, four panelists, and we will then open the discussion uh, to the audience by taking questions that you, that, uh, you in the audience might want to uh, send us by, via the reserved area on the platforms that you are uh, used. Let me just... Uh, make a few uh, introductory remarks before hearing from our uh, speakers tonight. Um, Europe plays an important role in Africa. We know that uh, on the aggregate, the EU, the EU um, is the continent's main trade partner, the main donor uh, in terms of uh, FDI stock, uh, the main um, uh, source of remittances, uh, sorry, the main investor in terms of FDI and the main donor. Um, Europe also has a need to work uh, with Africa to jointly address a number of challenges, such as strengthening uh, a global multilateral um, system, shaping the green transition, uh, managing migration, uh, to mention but a few. Um, and yet there's a lot of competition. Competition has been rising on the part of other external partners um, of, of African countries, uh, the number of which has been uh, growing a lot. Uh, the European Commission stated its aim of becoming a geopolitical actor, uh, and in early 2020, it proposed a new partnership uh, with Africa. The COVID-19 pandemic, however, uh, somehow put the EU proposal on a standstill. Uh, now there's a hope that uh, with the African Union, European Union uh, summit uh, early next year, um, we, uh, the two unions might uh, reach a new uh, pact, but negotiations and compromises, of course, are not going to be easy uh, when some 80 countries, that is African countries and European countries, are uh, more or less directly involved. So let's hear uh, about these issues uh, from our uh, panelists. And I would like to start with uh, Domenico Rosa, as I, as I say, um, head of Unit for Strategic Partnership with Africa and ACP countries at the Directorate General for International Partnerships of the European Commission. Uh, Domenico, um, the European Union proposed a, a new strategy with Africa in March 2020, and that was meant to be um, a, a draft proposal, a basis for negotiating new relations um, with Africa. What is the vision and what are the goals behind uh, that proposal, and possibly in addressing that, uh, can you uh, can you also uh, tell us something about uh, how the EU um, has gone about reconciling different positions within the Union itself with regard to uh, its relations with Africa? Domenico, please. Domenico, we cannot hear you. Can you switch on the mic? Sorry, I was double muted. <laughs> uh, no, thank you, Giovanni. Thank you very much for the this invitation uh, in uh, in attending this this panel. Um, as you rightly said, uh, well, more than uh, well, in, in nearly two years ago, uh, we 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 published this uh, this uh, communication that uh, the title was uh, towards uh, a comprehensive strategy with Africa. Uh, we 
came to this uh, um, document uh, uh, was a kind of uh, long uh, reflection that started in Abidjan when we realized that uh, from the, the, the Africa side, uh, the demand was uh, different compared to, to what was before and that the partnership should move uh, into a, a new level. In a way, the, 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 the former way of doing cooperation, of uh, re having relation with Africa, was not the, the, the right one. Uh, we, we realized in the, in the years that uh, were passing between 2017 and 2020 that uh, Africa was becoming more and more a place of attraction, if I may say, for, for other actors, uh, such as China, but uh, other new actors were, were appearing uh, on the, in the landscape, such as Turkey or, uh, uh, or India or Russia, and uh, that um, there was a need for uh, changing the, the nature of, of, the, of the partnership former strategy was adopted in 2007 so more than uh, than uh, 13 years uh, went through and uh, uh, in a way the, the, there was the need for moving into something that was uh, much more uh, respondent to the request uh, uh, coming from the africa continent in between the, the we may remember with the, the commission published the, the um, Europe Africa Alliance on uh, sustainable investment, uh, sustainable growth and investment and jobs. That uh, was the first attempt, uh, still during the Juncker Commission, to uh, move into this uh, uh, field of uh, economic investment uh, cooperation uh, uh, in order to create. Uh, uh, jobs uh, and uh, uh, and uh, to, to foster the investment in Africa in order to, to promote the, the, the sustainable growth. Uh, and therefore, uh, on, on this first uh, policy document, we moved into, into the, the, the document that I mentioned that uh, is uh, trying to focus around a uh, uh, few priorities that we, we consider that would be the, 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 what uh, we could consider, we can discuss with Africa in order to, to move forward. And uh, uh, the idea was the Africa should go through three the revolution uh, at the same time. The first one that is the, the industrial revolution, of course, because uh, we have to create uh, an internal uh, uh, market. At, at African level, you, you know that the, the intra-Africa trade is one of the lowest uh, uh, of the world. All the, the, the Africa trade is toward the, the external partners. Second, uh, that uh, this revolution should be as green as possible. And uh, there is the advantage that for many of the African countries, we are not starting from a, a, I would say, highly carbonized economy. And therefore, we are not even talking about the green transition. We are talking about the possibility of producing and distributing uh, sustainable and, and, and green energy. The uh, second, uh, the, the third element was uh, the, the question of the digital transformation in the sense that uh, the Africa was, uh, I would say, had the potential of uh, doing a, a real uh, uh, leapfrog in terms of uh, digital divide and therefore to move uh, and not to go through the, the, the initial step that uh, uh, through where the, 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 the EU went in the past. Of course, uh, peace and security, and uh, last but not least, migration and mobility. So these were, I would say, the, the element that we wanted to put on the table in order to discuss with the African partners, with stakeholders, uh, on uh, how we can build this new relationship. So to, to have, uh, first of all, uh, dynamic uh, and uh, interesting sectors for the, the, the African leaders that, as I, as I mentioned, was energy, digital, uh, investment, uh, uh, growth and job, uh, peace and security, and some elements that are, I would say, of more European concern, 
that uh, are the, the question of the migration and mobility, because uh, of course uh, uh, the, the 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 question of the migration, in particular two years ago, was uh, very high in, in the agenda, and uh, uh, in particular was uh, a kind of uh, a little bit divisive. Uh, issue among uh, among the, the the member states in the sense that some were saying uh, uh, of course uh, we have to to have a proper management of the the migration and therefore to try to 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 reap the the the, the benefit of uh, a regulated migration while other were completely in a defensive mode saying that no we have to stop the the, the migration flows uh, just by doing border management. And uh, of course, this is something that uh, is not possible. The, the approach of the, 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 the European Commission was to try to, to propose uh, an approach that is a little bit in between and therefore say, okay, on one side, uh, we, we can structure and reinforce the, 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 the management and the security um, dimension of the migration, but at the same time, we have to, 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 to propose a legal path of the migration and uh, to, uh, we should also to be able to uh, would say propose uh, uh, would say a kind of mobility uh, uh, pact uh, for, the, for the, the youth in the, in the, in the, in the, in the continent. Unfortunately, the one week after or a few days after the, the, the publication of this uh, strategy, we went into the lockdown. And then uh, I would say, uh, I think that then we can maybe elaborate later on on what happened in this uh, in this period. Thank I you, do, thank yeah. you, Domenico. Um, I wrote down some of the things that you said, and I would like to use them to pose a question to uh, Neza Alawi, a senior fellow um, at the Policy Center for the New South. Um, you, Domenico said. Uh, well, we wanted a, a new strategy to respond to requests, uh, to the requests of African countries. He also said, uh, I'm quoting more or less your words, our idea is that Africa needs to go through three revolutions. So somehow it, he's expressing, uh, you know, uh, the EU views of uh, what African demands are, uh, what African needs are. So this raises the question of what actually the sticking points uh, that the, are there in negotiating with the EU uh, from an African perspective. Neza, please. Um, thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you uh, this evening to uh, discuss um, EU, EU partnership, and I would like in this regard to thank Instituto per gli Studi di Politica Internazionale for organizing jointly with the Policy Center of the New South this uh, interesting um, round table about the, the, the topic that I mentioned. Um, sticking point with the, with EU, I, I have to say that um, before uh, uh, talking about the sticking point that I personally see that after two decades of uh, existence, the partnership of, between African Union and or Africa and, uh, and European Union, um, it became very clear that uh, both sides have a common willingness to engage differently and move uh, towards uh, a revamped, renewed, revised, we can give many, many uh, adjectives to, to that uh, relationship, a new relationship between the two, uh, the two continents. And move, and especially move away from a donor recipient dynamic towards a more balanced uh, relationship. And in this regard, as Domenico has mentioned, uh, EU uh, released in March 2020 a joint communication titled Towards a Comprehensive Strategy with Africa offering a basis for the new uh, uh, Africa strategy. And uh, as Domenico not so uh, Neza, you, the connection is not working in... right. So we lost you for a few seconds. What's uh, said. However, however, uh, the willingness for Neza, 
I think we have a problem uh, with your connection. Um, is there a way you can uh, improve this? Neza, can you hear me? Let's, let's move on um, to, and, and maybe somehow um, ask this kind of question to Alex with regard to uh, the specific um, topic of climate change and the green transition. Uh, what are Africa's main positions on climate change and the green transition? Alex. Yes, uh, well, thank you again also from my side for uh, having me join this uh, discussion. Um, first to step back and just reflect on the fact that this partnership that has been mentioned briefly by the, by the first two speakers has obviously come, come along uh, many years. And from, the, from pretty much the beginning, it was recognized that there is a, a joint interest in dealing with environmental and climate issues. Um, and I think deepening and strengthening that element of the cooperation and building on what has come before is uh, clearly an important element if you look at all the strategic documents and the discussions. It's part of this revitalization, it's part of this engagement outside of the traditional mold of donor and, 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 and donor recipient. So... What are the main views on climate change and the green transition in Africa? Starting point for the region, and, and we're, we, the benefit for us is that through the Africa group of negotiators, at, at the, uh, through the UNFCC COP process, um, this, this agenda has been very well articulated. There's a clear point that the starting point is that Africa has the lowest historical contributions to climate change in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. But it's the region most impacted, certainly one of the regions most impacted by climate change. Uh, the reality is that Africa regions continue to face significant challenges, um, highly reliant on sectors that will be impacted by, by climate change. Agriculture obviously comes to mind, um, extremely important for the economies, but also for livelihoods. And we're not just talking about agriculture in a gen generic sense, but largely small-scale agriculture, rain-fed agriculture, so particularly vulnerable to climate change impacts. Um, I think we've already heard electricity access remains extremely low. It's the lowest of any uh, region in the world. Um, I mean, an interesting way of looking at it is to say that three out of every four people in the world who don't have electricity uh, access to electricity are in Africa. Um, and then we also, ha I mean, the region has a has a, a population that's young, it's growing, it's urbanizing. So I mean, I don't want to present too too uh, negative a picture, but I think it's important to recognize um, the developmental challenges faced by the continent. But there's the other side too. There's 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 the Africa of of vibrant growth and innovation, of entrepreneurship, and an ambition, clear ambition for an integrated prosperous region that, that, that plays its rightful role on the world stage uh, and a region that we know is rich in resources. Agenda 2063, the continental framework um, for, for the region for, for the, that encapsulates this vision. So the main views on climate change, uh, given the region's vulnerability, we need an adequate focus on adaptation. The conversation around how we respond to climate change cannot just be around um, mitigation around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We need to talk about and support adapting, adapting to, to the climate impacts that we will uh, experience to a degree. Um, the region, I think, stands ready to deploy its available resources to support uh, both adaptation and mitigation efforts largely, but I think it's clear to everyone that those resources are insufficient. So strong yeah. emphasis Alex, can you please clarify the distinction between um, adaptation and mitigation for those uh, in the audience who are not familiar with that? Yes, absolutely. So the easiest way to understand it is, um, uh, well, when we're first exposed to the debates on climate change, um, uh, much of the discussion tends to focus on carbon emissions and how we can reduce carbon emissions and achieve ultimately net 
zero carbon emissions. And that is the key pathway to try and prevent um, global warming. Um, and that discussion has tended to dominate, at least in the early stages, uh, global discussions around responding to climate change. But as I was saying, it's now evident that climate change well, is already impacting and over coming decades will increasingly impact the world and various regions. And regions are vulnerable to different degrees and in different ways to these impacts. So that's when we talk about adapting to climate change, increasing resilience, or we talk about climate resilient development. Um, so absolutely, we must continue the focus on reducing emissions and preventing carbon uh, global warming as far as possible. But we cannot be blind to the fact that there is a degree of global warming that is going to happen. And we need to prepare ourselves, increase our resilience, and work with partners to do so. So that's the, that's the, that's the uh, distinction. So, yes, Africa says we mustn't forget about adaptation. We must ensure that that's adequately supported. Also, again, I was saying about resources. So there are some internal resources, but they're not going to be sufficient. So Africa has always been very clear that... Number one, there's a historic responsibility to a degree. Um, but certainly, you know, where you stand on that debate, regardless of that, Africa does need the support. Finance is obviously a big part of that, but it's also around technical assistance and capacity development, technological cooperation. There are various components of that support. And then, very importantly, that this support must be must leverage synergies between the continent's climate agenda and its development agenda. And I think that's, that's what we were hearing from the previous speaker before, um, before the connectivity disrupted, is that there's, there is a, a pressing need to promote growth, industrialization, to create jobs for the continent's young population. And we need to find ways in which we can, through responding to climate change, through building a green economy, at the same time address these agendas. There are still some who present it as some sort of choice. You need to cut down on economic growth or, or reduce your ambition in order to be environmentally responsible. The, the narrative that is emerging from the research and is increasingly dominant in the policy debates is, is quite the contrary, is by building resilient economies, by embracing green technologies and building green economies, we can actually create the jobs of the future, create the skills and position Africa um, strategically in terms of where the geostrategic order and the global economy, shall we say broadly, is moving over the coming 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, there's also the question of, uh, you know, as I said, are there, are there significant uh, uh, divisions? I, I, I think one's got to recognize the continent is extremely diverse. We've got small island states. We've got Alex, we'll come back to that. Okay, we'll come back let's, to that. let's come uh, back to that. I see that Neza, is, is, she's back with us. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, do you want to conclude your, your um, intervention, the points you were making? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Giovanni. And apologies for the interruption, but uh, this is uh, the, a challenge that we are quite often facing in Addis Ababa uh, internet connection. So thank you for your patience. So I was saying that... Um, um, regarding the, the, the major sticking points that I, I, I see in the AU, um, EU partnership, uh, there are mainly three for me. Uh, the first sticking point is uh, how to define and shape an African leadership and African uh, ownership that can be reflected in a common agenda of the partnership. The second sticking point is... Uh, to uh, secure or to have or to uh, uh, start uh, reflecting on an African strategy uh, able to support an African ambition to, uh, to renew uh, the partnership with, uh, with the European Union. And thirdly, um, a bigger 
uh, coherence from the European uh, partners uh, in its in ambition to renew the partnership. So quickly, let me just give uh, some uh, uh, um, clarification, explanation about these three sticking points that I see. For the African leadership and African ownership, um, it's, it's, it's um, how can I say it? It could be... Uh, um, um, interesting to see more African documents or more African proposals during the preparation process uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the partnership. Uh, the, because uh, before we get to the uh, summit, and, and maybe Domenico will, will agree with me, we have many steps, the high uh, 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 representative, then the ministerial uh, uh, meeting, and then uh, finally the, the, the summit. That, it could be that African documents and proposal uh, will help to uh, articulate a vision, an African vision, in order to reflect the continent's expectation for its partnership with the uh, with EU. Because if we have to move from that dynamic that I mentioned uh, um, earlier uh, uh, between the donor and the recipient, we have uh, and and move towards a more equal uh, um, relationship. We have. Uh, uh, to have an equal uh, contribution to that uh, uh, process and uh, also uh, participate and contribute to the substance that can build and shape that that uh, that partnership and um, it's it's quite interesting to to underline that as illustrated with agenda 2063 the african union does have ambitions and uh, and uh, and goals for the continent but it is difficult and, and often and clear uh, how these uh, uh, goals and ambition, ambitions relate to its international uh, relations. The second point that I have mentioned as a sticking point, an African strategy that can support uh, uh, an African uh, ambition, that strategy, uh, uh, if uh, uh, we can have it, can, can, can reflect the goal of African Union in its international relations with its different partners because Today we are talking about European Union, but as we know, uh, African Union uh, uh, has many partnerships and, and, and many partners. So uh, shaping a strategy can help African Union to define a clear uh, vision and a clear uh, orientation with each one of uh, its partners and conceptualize better its, its commitment to, uh, to contribute to, uh, to that partnership. And finally, the third sticking point that I see is um, the, the coherence that African uh, countries uh, are expecting from, from Europe. And let me uh, um, explain it quickly. Um, it's still unclear for the African side how the strategy, the European strategy or the uh, European approach will fit uh, with the post Cotonou negotiation, for example, and uh, uh, or with the new financing mechanism that will replace the European Development Fund. Uh, to date, uh, Africa and the European Union partnership has been has been shaped mainly by frameworks developed by uh, European Union, uh, including the Joint Africa EU strategy adopted in Lisbon in 2007. But this Joint uh, Africa Europe strategy does not always work in harmony with other agreements, such as the 2000 Cotonou Agreement, which is now uh, uh, renegotiated, uh, does not also work in harmony with regional strategies adopted by EU Council, such as the strategy for the Horn of Africa, the Gulf of Guinea, and the Sahel, and uh, does not also work uh, 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 necessarily in harmony with bilateral trade pact with South Africa, for example. So quickly, th those are the three uh, main sticking points that uh, I can mention. Thank you. Thank you, Neza. And I want uh, Domenico to come back to this question of uh, the relationship between the POSCO to New Deal and the new strategy. But uh, not right now. Just uh, be before that, let me hear uh, um, from Amanda Bizong. Um, policy officer at the European Center for Development Policy Management. Um, another uh, perspective from which trying to um, highlight Africa's position is on the issue of migration. Um, what about Africa's views on migration when compared to uh, the European approach? Is there, and, and more specifically, is there something that we as Europeans fail to understand? about how um, Africans look at migration. Amanda. 
Um, thank you very much, Giovanni, for your invitation to speak at this event. And also um, thanks to all the other lovely panelists that have, uh, have intervened before me and have given me a very good background to build on. I think I'll start from something that Alex just mentioned uh, and he touched on this, but then we said we're going to delve into it in further details, uh, talking about the climate change and that there isn't one particular perspective or one particular African interest. There is a diversity of interest when it comes to also uh, migration issues on the continent. It. So while it's, uh, it's interesting to speak about an African perspective on migration, however, what we see is that this is influenced by the different, uh, by the different interests and the different layers, depending on where you are looking at and where the cooperation is happening. Um, so we, we, of course, you have the, the AU agenda when it comes to migration, which focuses more on migration and development, looking at regional integration, uh, facilitating mobility on the continent, um, and, and then uh, also has some aspects as it relates to uh, uh, refugee protection and, uh, and, and economic development and, and security security issues when it comes to, to mobility. Uh, at the next level, you have uh, uh, regional agendas also when it comes to, to managing uh, uh, migration. And, and these regional agendas mostly uh, uh, pushed by the regional organizations and the various regional economic communities on the continent of which there are many, um, usually focus also on the economic aspects of mobility. And we see that in some aspect, in some, in some areas in the region, so in some areas in the continent, we see some movement, a lot of movement when it comes to uh, regional mobility, for example, in West Africa or East Africa. But in some other regions, we see that it's a bit stuck when it comes to uh, discussions on, on, uh, on regional mobility. Um, and then, of course, you have the national agendas when, you, when, when we're looking at migration. So for some countries, there is the benefit, they, they, they clearly draw the links between the economic uh, agenda, uh, regional integration, facilitating mobility of people, and how this links also to uh, promoting um, employment for young people. For other countries, it's also an issue of development uh, and uh, looking at remittances. For some, it's more an issue of restrictiveness and looking at the security challenges. So I would love to say that there's one one particular way of looking at migration on the continent, but unfortunately uh, there isn't. But if we do look at the AU agenda and where it prioritizes the areas of uh, areas it prioritizes when it comes to migration cooperation, then we see that the focus is largely on migration and development, saying that migration is a key, uh, a key, a key uh, um, uh, instrument for achieving uh, development, economic development on the continent, and also promoting social welfare of people on the continent. So this is one thing we can also clearly see when we look at, for example, Agenda 2063. We see those lines drawing back again to migration and development, and and I think that this plurality of interests when it comes to migration on the continent is one thing that the EU. I mean, is aware of, but fails to acknowledge most times when discussing uh, um, uh, migration and mobility on the continent. And rather what we see is a fixation on specific aspects uh, of, of migration uh, and, and, and mobility in these discussions. So for example, fixation on the securitization of migration, looking mostly at the security aspect or fixation on returns and readmissions, which have become uh, the new, the new um, area that there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of focus on. Um, I think also it's uh, it's important to 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 mention that the, the the there has been a lot of work uh, between and a lot of cooperation between the EU and the EU on migration and development. However, what we're seeing in recent times is a reduction in the focus on migration and development and the more uh, uh, more or more uh, strategic approach of of the EU towards focusing now on on returns and. Re admissions, which of course is not 
is not to say that this isn't part of the plethora of interests that African countries are looking at, but it's not particularly the priority uh, uh, for, for most, for, for a large majority of African countries. The focus still remains on linking uh, migration and development issues. Yeah. Amanda, Amanda, let me pose you another question. Um, you, you mentioned a number of um, issues in which the migration topic can be somehow unpacked and, and views about migration that Africans hold. Uh, but uh, what about possible differences among African countries? Are there African countries that prioritize certain specific aspects of migration that have very more specific concerns uh, as opposed to others? Can you think definitely. of and provide examples? Definitely, definitely. So when we when we look at the regional picture, for example, I, I gave the example of, 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 of uh, East Africa and West Africa being more advanced when it comes to regional mobility. And if we look at South and Africa, you see that the regional mobility process is a bit stuck there. And uh, mobility there, that region occurs mostly through bilateral agreements. Also, if we're looking at the national agenda of, of countries when it comes to uh, 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 promoting migration or migration cooperation in general, we see that within these regions where there is more movement or more mobility um, through the RECs, we see an interest in, uh, in, in, in cooperating on, on migration issues. However, in regions where there are where it's a bit stuck, we see a, a, a more restrictive practices. So across the region, you get a picture of different uh, of varying interests. Of of course, there are several African states with restrictive uh, migration policies. There are African uh, countries that focus on the economic aspects, so creating an environment where people can move. And we see this now with the increase also in, uh, I think it's, it's called the, the African Development Bank has something called the uh, Africa Visa Openness Index, where it shows the, 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 the way, um, the, the progression of how Africans have been able to move across the continent uh, when it comes to um, entry visas or visas on arrival. And we see a lot of increase in this from about, I think, 42% um, a few years ago. And now it's about 50% of African countries that uh, other, other people, other, other Africans on the continent can move to due to visa on arrival measures. We see that there are liberalization measures ongoing, but at the same time, in certain countries, there are also uh, restrictive practices uh, uh, that, that, are, that are going on in terms of migration. There are also countries that focus on, on the securitization of migration um, aspects, especially as it relates uh, also to, to increasing terrorism in several regions on the continent. So the picture is very varied um, on, on the continent. Thanks, Amanda. Domenico, uh, in, in her contribution, Neza uh, essentially posed a question that I think you are uh, right there uh, for answering to. Um, she said, uh, it, it's unclear how the new strategy, the draft proposal of the EU, uh, will fit with the post-Cotonou deal uh, that was achieved between uh, uh, the African, Caribbean, Pacific countries and the European Union uh, earlier this year. Uh, I know that uh, you have uh, dealt with the, with the post-Cotonou um, re renewal issue uh, as well. Can you uh, tell us, um, can you clarify how these two ways of relating the EU to African countries fit with each, with each other, sorry? Yes, okay, no, uh, thank you. I think that uh, is, uh, it's in itself a little bit a false question that uh, is uh, is based uh, uh, on a kind of ideological stance, if I may say, in the sense that uh, I don't see uh, any um, inconsistencies or incoherence between uh, the, the post-Cotonou agreement that uh, you maybe know that has been structured in order to, to take into account in a more prominent way, what are the needs and the, 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 the situation of, of Africa or the other three regions, you know that 
before Cotonou was a kind of monolithic agreement covering uh, in uh, one size fits all uh, solution the three areas, Caribbean, Pacific, and, uh, and Africa. Of course, when you were uh, producing the, the negotiating directive for the renewal of the Cotonou Agreement, we went through uh, a cost benefit analysis and evaluation uh, a desk analysis of the and we realized that, of course, the, the three regions that uh, at the beginning were uh, sharing common challenges and so on uh, moved uh, in completely different uh, uh, direction and uh, with different completely, not completely, but well, with the different uh, needs and different perspective of development. Of course, there were some basics that uh, remain valid for everybody such as the fundamental value, the universal uh, value, the question of political data. So we decided to go for a structure of the new, new agreement that was based in a foundation that is common for everybody. And I think that there is no shame in saying that this is common to us, to ACP, to any other part of the world in itself. And then having three protocol that were supporting uh, the development of the three uh, areas on the basis of their need. If you go through the, because the, now the, the initial text is public, if you go through the Africa protocol, you will see that the Africa protocol is essentially based on uh, uh, Africa policy documents, such as the Agenda 2063, the CADEP for the, the agricultural development, other policy framework that are referring to other specific uh, specific uh, specific areas, and is definitely structured, uh, I would say, is more comprehensive, but is very similar to what uh, uh, you can now find in the uh, in the in the in the document that is toward a joint strategy. Toward a joint strategy, of course, is much more restrictive in terms of uh, uh, action because is is much more action oriented and uh, is uh, a time frame that is it's shorter. Then I think that we have to also to consider that uh, the scope. Uh, is different. Post Cotonou is a, is a legal instrument in order to create uh, association agreement between the European Union, its member state, and each of African country of sub-Saharan country. So the 48 out of 58, 55 members of the of the African Union. While the the the, the partnership with the African Union remain. A, a broader political uh, uh, framework that, uh, uh, in a way, should shape the, the the direction where we would like to to go. Uh, last but not least, we we mentioned explicitly in the the the, the Africa in the governance part of the post Cotonou agreement that the, the 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 decision of the summit of the African Union European Union. Uh, summit uh, will in a way steer the process uh, for the implementation of the protocol in order to create uh, the, this coherence. So I don't think that there is any any different... Uh, the, 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 the problem is that we were starting where from a situation where we have four individual association agreements with the Northern African countries, it's like Morocco, Algeria, uh, Tunisia, and, and Egypt, and then all the other 48 uh, sub-Saharan countries that are covered by Cotonou Agreement and in future by post-Cotonou Agreement. So the, the, the nature also of the, 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 the partnership is, is in a way different. One is a legally binding instrument that uh, will allow to have a privileged uh, meet the relation with each individual country uh, in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. And uh, while the, the relation with the African Union is, the, I would say, to, to, to agree on the, the continental uh, uh, priority where African Union can have a, an added value and a specific mandate. Because when you talk to Africa, you, are, you cannot talk about uh, say a unitarian entity. Uh, you have, I would say, multiple Africas. Domenico, Domenico let's hear uh, on, on this specific point. Let, let's hear uh, from Neza. Uh, Neza, uh, we haven't talked much uh, about the African Union except for this last point raised by Domenico. Uh, to what extent can the, the, the African Union act as a, as a player 
on behalf of the continent, representing African positions when negotiating with the European Union? Um, to, to, to answer to this question, uh, Giovanni, I, it's, it's, um, it's, um, I will take it from what Domenico has said in terms of uh, uh, frameworks. Um, EU, uh, since the beginning, has set up uh, a different frameworks. Uh, it, um, the European Union was dealing with one continent, but uh, according to different frameworks. So uh, North Africa uh, is... Um... Do you hear me? Yes, we can. We do hear okay. you. Um, yeah, so uh, North Africa, as Domenico has mentioned, uh, was uh, under the uh, neighborhood uh, uh, policy. Then we have uh, the ACP uh, framework, the Cotonou, uh, what we call the Cotonou uh, agreement. And then we have South Africa, which is uh, 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 linked with, with European Union within another uh, uh, framework. So this uh, creates a, a diversity uh, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, frameworks, diversity of uh, uh, commitments, diversity of priorities. And um, of course, uh, uh, Africa is diverse, uh, but as soon as we talk about continent to continent relationship, there is a coherence to, uh, to, uh, to find, there is a, a common denom denominator to, uh, to find and to build, uh, and to build on. Um, those different frameworks uh, have built uh, uh, um, uh, different uh, priorities. If I have to talk about North Africa, uh, I have to say that it has nothing to do with uh, with uh, with Cotonou uh, agreement uh, framework. Uh, on the top of that, we have also to say that uh, um, the diversity of, of African countries is also related to uh, uh, differences in terms of integration. Uh, West Africa, uh, the, the ECOWAS uh, 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 regional economic community is more compact, more, in, more integrated than the Northern African uh, community, for example. So this brings another factor of, of diversity. However, however, despite all these factors of, of diversity, uh, we have to uh, recognize that Agenda 2063 uh, still a common uh, commitment for all member states of African Union. And they have also uh, committed themselves by signing uh, for a, a continental project, by signing uh, the, the agreement for the African Free Trade Zone Agreement, uh, which is a big achievement for the, for the whole continent. So in one hand, we have a, a diversity of uh, um, uh, frameworks of cooperation uh, uh, established by European Union since beginning. Diversity uh, in terms of level of integration uh, uh, in, 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 in within the different uh, uh, African regions. But in another hand, we have uh, a continental framework, uh, 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 continental uh, commitment uh, uh, to comply with Agenda 2063, and also uh, a continental uh, commitment to uh, uh, set up this uh, uh, big achievement, which is the African Free Trade uh, Zone Agreement. Thank you, Neza. Uh, I want to go back to, uh, to Alex. Um, and ask you two, two things. Um, one is, um, I'd like you to go back to the point where I interrupted you, the question of the um, differences uh, between African countries in terms of uh, their approach, their concerns, their interests with regard to climate change and the green transition. And I also want to start taking questions from other, our audience. Uh, Mark asks, um, what did uh, the COP26 tell us about Euro-African relations, if anything? Um, I don't know if you can comment on this as well. Please. Okay, absolutely. So, well, we've already said multiple times Africa is diverse, and we see that profile in the energy mix as well. So some countries very reliant on fossil fuels, the country where I'm based, South Africa, um, you know, it's, it's widely known, extremely reliant on coal-powered uh, electricity generation. And um, 
Uh, uh, not too long ago, we had the Africa Energy in Daba, where the South African Minister of, of Energy and Mineral Resources spoke, and um, it, that pretty much encapsulated that, I, I think, uh, a more cautious approach, more s perhaps even skeptical approach to, shall we say, the green agenda or, this, or the um, uh, just position uh, agenda. Um, so absolutely, there's 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 not one one voice in the region. I, I think certainly what we've seen is on the EU side a willingness to to listen and engage. And there were extensive engagements ahead of COP twenty six um, from from the EU climate EU Commission climate lead Franz Timmermans and others to listen to and understand um, positions on climate change on the continent, including in South Africa. Um, and I think this relates then to the question of, of what does COP26 tell us? Well, certainly there are some touch points on the agenda. Um, I think also the, the region shares a degree of frustration with um, perhaps the... the um, somewhat less than expected outcomes but one of the one of the early kind of uh, uh, news announcements from cop26 was uh, a major new agreement for financing and support for the just transition um, for south africa and specifically to support a transition away from coal and the creation of 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 green jobs um, we know that the forestry agreement, which was also uh, announced early in terms of the COP26 process, is going to mean significant resources to countries in Central Africa, West Africa, other regions where major major forest regions are concerned. So there are there were definite and concrete steps taken. I think that starts to show us how this cooperation can move forward. Um, and I think it's, you know, this will be fleshed out further as we move towards the, the EU Africa Summit, of course. Alex, let me now read you uh, two different questions from the audience. And I would like um, any of you who wants to react to these questions to, um, to take the floor. Andrea asks, uh, or better says and then asks, um, the proposed strategy con uh, contains five main pillars, but the impact of COVID has also brought new emergencies. First and foremost, the redistribution of vaccines and support to health systems. The question is, how will these aspects be integrated into a partnership, especially in light of the slow access to vaccines in Africa? So this is the first point. Uh, the second question is by Paola. Uh, she asks, Africa is in a serious debt crisis and requires strong resources to drive recovery. Could this slow down the goals set in the partnership? How will the strategy address this urgent issue? And let me uh, maybe uh, frame this under a, a common umbrella. The, the, the big question is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the scenario of EU-Africa relations? Who wants to start? I'll take a, a quick. I'll take a quick stab at it. I don't have that much to say on specifically cooperation around around vaccine. We're aware of the the, the debate and, and the the um, the negative part of a kind of a vaccine competition. What I want to focus on more is that. Uh, we certainly saw early leadership by the EU region around the, the idea of a green recovery um, and a clearly articulated strategy financing around that. And that debate has certainly emerged as well, quite concretely in the Africa region as well. And I think there, um, in particular, there are very interesting opportunities for cooperation that tie into the issues that I've been speaking about, enhancing resilience, um, green jobs, green economy interventions. So 
that area I think is a particular interest to me, and I think there's significant potential to take that that debate forward. As I said, I'm, I'm I haven't been following um, the 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 vaccine debate specifically to comment on that. Yeah, Alex, Domenico, I think you wanted to yeah. um, give your point. No, thank you. you. I think that uh, the, the two things. Uh, first of all, uh, it's clear that uh, the, the the COVID pandemics changed uh, uh, a lot. At the same time, we consider that the fundamentals of the the strategy remain valid as such. So access, the production of energy, uh, green say transition. I, I don't like to talk about the green transition for Africa because I don't think that we are in, in the same uh, situation as Europe where we have to do a, a green transition. I think that we, we can talk about the green growth that maybe is better, is better adapted to the, to the situation. And uh, of course, investment, growth, jobs, and so on. So I think that uh, the, the fundamental remain valid. What, what we realized, for, of course, is that uh, we neglect uh, the most probably the, the, the social and human development aspect, even if they are mentioned in the strategy, their place is not uh, so prominent. And in, in, in particular, when we refer to health, we realized that uh, the, the, there was, uh, I would say, a big, uh, um, a big problem in the sense, and this was exacerbated by the, 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 the lack of vaccine at the very beginning and by the difficulties in the distributing and administer the, the, the vaccination in Africa. And uh, therefore, uh, we, we start elaborating uh, something new in terms of what we could uh, talk about uh, Africa autonomy as far as uh, vaccine production, medicine production and, uh, and medical, uh, uh, other medical staff are concerned in the sense that uh, we think that uh, uh, after the pandemic is over and after the emergency uh, action that we put in place, uh, then we have to work for creating this capacity of Africa of reacting in a kind of autonomous way to uh, possibility of pandemics that, well, in the past there was Ebola, there was very much uh, limited and so on. In terms of uh, immediate recovery, I think that uh, what we did uh, was to, to try, it because we were in the, in the final part of the former, former uh, uh, multi-annual financial framework, we tried to reshape the, the or to, to re, re, reuse the money that was still unused in, in order to, to, to put in place a kind of recovery plan for, uh, for Africa. And uh, we managed through the, the Team Europe initiative to, to mobilize uh, more than uh, 8 billion euros uh, uh, for sub-Saharan Africa. We were at the same time, just to respond to the other question uh, on the debt crisis, the, even if it's not in the mandate of the European Union, to, to push and, and promote the, 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 the debt moratory for the, the African countries uh, during the, the, the COVID era. So I think that now that we are in the new financial framework, we are, I would say, we use this experience in order to programming for the future, take into account what I mentioned, that the, 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 the human and, and social development was one of the missing part of the, the, the original strategy. Over to you. Cool. Uh, Amanda, uh, do you have any comments to, in response to the questions I read? Um, so I haven't been following the vaccine debate closely, so I will not attempt to, to speak on that. And also with the debt crisis, I haven't really followed that, uh, that debate closely, so I equally will not attempt to speak on that. But on the issue of COVID-19, changing the relationship uh, between uh, uh, or changing the nature of, of the partnership, I think that this is something that, uh, that we've clearly seen. And, and Domenico has, has referred to some aspects um, of, of 
of of uh, the partnership that were not really prominent in this uh, in the strategy uh, um, uh, that was released by the EU. I think when it does touch on migration and, and mobility issues, we see that COVID nineteen has equally played a, a huge role in impacting mobility. Obviously, with the lockdowns, but now as 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 mobility is restarting um, again uh, across across uh, globally across the world and also so between between African countries and European countries, we see that the 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 role of of um, of yeah of, of vaccine inequality also is playing an important uh, is vaccine inequality is playing an important role when it comes to um, uh, restricting the mobility of people. So uh, there there have been several reports of of uh, of, of of Africans unable to move. Uh, uh, obviously through reg regular channels to European countries um, as a result of their vaccines not being recognized or uh, also the issues with, uh, with, with, with getting uh, vaccines in several African countries and, uh, and some, uh, some EU member states not being able to, to keep up with their pledges uh, of, of, of vaccines to these countries. And this has hugely affected uh, mobility, not only on the continent, but between the continent and 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 Europe. So I think that this is this is something that really has to be has to be considered the role of COVID nineteen uh, uh, as it affects uh, migration and mobility between uh, uh, both continents. And, and moving forward, what can be done, especially uh, if we look also at at uh, at people moving through regular channels uh, and 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 the legal pathways that have been established, uh, limited as they might be, but still. Uh, Things like uh, like like uh, vaccine passports also play a role in in restricting the mobility of of people. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Neza, um, is there anything you want to add to um, this? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. Um, when uh, at the beginning of this roundtable, we're talking about the, the common willingness of uh, both Africa and Europe to uh, 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 revise and, and revamp the, the, the partnership. And uh, during that reflection, uh, uh, the pandemic came in. And um, that and the, during the pandemic, we all uh, were following the news and uh, heard that it, there is uh, definitely a before and after pandemic. And the world after the pandemic COVID-19 will not be the same as, as, as before. But that pandemic uh, highlights for the African countries uh, the um, importance or the need of uh, uh, human security and um, the need also to, uh, to, uh, to shape uh, uh, in any um, decision or, 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 or policy, a people-centered approach uh, in order to, uh, to secure uh, uh, um, human, human security. Um, last month, on the 26th of October, we, uh, we, uh, we had the ministerial uh, conference of AU-AU uh, uh, partnership held in Kigali on the 26th of October, 2021. And just to answer to the first question of, uh, I think, uh, Andrea, um, the joint um, statement, press statement uh, between the two uh, uh, sides uh, uh, highlights the, the need of uh, um, a people-centered approach uh, and uh, to put that people-centered approach at the core of the AU-AU uh, uh, partnership. And uh, among the, the, the uh, pillars that they have, uh, that AU and EU defined for uh, the, the next uh, uh, summit, we have as a first pillar, the joint COVID-19 response, uh, increasing access to vaccines, medicines, and technologies, because uh, definitely this pandemic has shown also the lack of equity to access to, uh, uh, to vaccines and to uh, share to share uh, uh, um, uh, health technologies in order to be ready uh, to contribute to the response to any uh, uh, um, uh, security threats related to uh, uh, public health. Thank you. Thank you, Neza. Um, we have reached the end of the time at our uh, disposal. Um, so I apologize for not reading out um, any more of the questions, the many questions that we have um, received from our um, audience. 
Um, I would like to thank um, our speakers. Uh, let me uh, remind the full uh, names of our speakers tonight. Neza Alawi Mamdi, Senior Fellow at the Policy Center for the New South. Alex Benkenstein, Head of the Governance uh, of Africa's Resources Program at the South African Institute of International Affairs. Amanda Bizong, Policy Officer at the European Center for Development Policy Management. And Domenico Rosa, Head of Unit uh, for Strategic Partnership with Africa and ACP countries at the Directorate General um, uh, for International Partnerships of the European Commission. Um, when we designed um, tonight's webinar, uh, our idea was to put together uh, perspectives, broad perspectives on uh, Euro-African relations, while also trying to get a, a sense of some of the key topics, um, such as specifically uh, climate change and migration. Um, I think it was a useful debate, um, particularly to understand uh, the stakes uh, and the differences between the EU uh, and, uh, and African countries, or at least part of the stakes and the differences on the way uh, towards the African Union, European Union uh, Summit of 2022. So uh, thanks again to um, the four of you. Uh, let me just uh, finally remember our audience that uh, this seminar, uh, we, we took the occasion of the publication of two reports uh, to organize this seminar. Uh, one is a new ISPI report entitled Europe and Africa, the long search for common ground. And the other one is the policy center for um, the new South annual report on the geopolitics of Africa. Both reports can be downloaded uh, freely from the websites of the two institutes. So um, once again, thanks to everybody, to our audience and our speakers uh, and have a nice evening. Thank you.